Hi. Thank you. This one. Even better? Okay. Even better. Now we have a microphone that works well and you will are all able to hear me. It's a bit difficult for me to hear because I'm actually behind the speakers and I hear a lot of background noise. Um, but yeah, welcome to this event on building sector it's actions. Uh, the unprecedented opportunity for climate change commitments. Um, so today we are going to talk about um, overall how can we increase the commitments and how can we measure the commitments or monitor the commitments from countries in terms of um, the building sector specifically. And we will specifically look at how we measure buildings into the national determined contributions. Uh, so there is, uh, under the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, we've started uh, work with the Global Building Performance Network and Monash University to develop a tool that can help monitoring uh, the actually the actions of uh, countries in their NDCs for the building sector. We have six panelists today. Um, four of them will be online. And um, I, th I hope we have everyone online, but um, so first we have Dr. Peter Graham, who is an associate professor at the Department of Architecture at Monash University, and was also the executive director of the Green Buildings Performance Network. Then we have Dr. Ashraf Kamal, who is a professor of architecture and urban planning uh, at the Housing and Building National Research Center in Egypt. Um, then we will have Jamila El Harizi, the head of architectural valorization and sustainability division in the Ministry of Territory Planning, Land Planning and Housing and City Policy of Morocco. Uh, we will have, and I will kindly invite Dr. Sunita Purushotham to join me here uh, in front. So. Uh, Dr. Sunita is actually um, working at uh, Mahindra Life Spaces uh, and she's the sustainability uh, director for Mahindra Life Spaces, who is a developer of buildings and housing in India. And uh, finally, I will invite uh, Diane. I'm sorry, I actually I'm really sorry, I don't see your family name on my notes. <laughs> and, oh, Diane Kral, sorry. <laughs> it's difficult when you have the screen in the back. So Diane Kral, um, join us please from Monash University. Uh, and yeah, so we have our, all our panel set. Finally, we'll have also Craig Burton, who is a senior research manager Department of Architecture at Monash University and the Head of Innovation for the Green Building Performance Network. Um, I will start the session uh, by asking each of our panel members uh, to give a short overview um, of like introductory remarks, let's say, to start the discussion afterwards. And um, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Peter Graham who will be uh, presenting on the 11 criteria that we have selected uh, for front runner building sector commitments that are built in the tool that I mentioned that we are developing with uh, GBP and the Monash University. So Peter, I hand over to you and I hope my colleagues can put you on the screen and I guess, oh, sorry. Sorry, I went a bit fast, but <laughs> Peter, can that, you take over? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, thanks so much, Jonathan. Just checking you can hear me okay. I can hear you well. Brilliant. Okay, well, if you could advance the slides, that would be fantastic. So um, if you've got that, that uh, control, then uh, you can move forward in the slide deck there. Um, Yeah, or you, you can see me too. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. So, all right. So, um, 
this was really uh, the the, uh, the context, Jonathan, for for the work, right? So um, we can skip a little bit of this, but I think this is a good slide to start on. Uh, we have 158 countries who having have mentioned buildings in their NDCs, and so this is a very important aspect of. Um, it's a milestone, in fact, that demonstrates that most countries in the world see the building sector as a real focus for climate action. And uh, underneath these 158 uh, countries are thousands of subnational commitments from the private sector, from universities, from uh, state and local governments. So I think we can say definitely that uh, we have a strong commitment for decarbonizing the building sector internationally and our challenge is to turn those commitments into accomplishments and I think that's really the the basis for the work that we're doing here with UNEP and, and Global ABC is to try and make it a lot easier for uh, countries, for potential investors or donors, for uh, NGOs who are offering support for implementation of building sector actions to actually find the commitments um, that countries are making and also to understand whether the commitments that are being made are ambitious and on track for the, the Paris Agreement. So with that um, basic introduction, Jonathan, I think you could skip through to the, uh, the slides which talk about the criteria. Yep, one more. And that's me, yes. So just there, here we go. Okay, great. So um, UN, uh, the Global Alliance on Buildings and Construction asked GBPN and Monash University to uh, work out a way of being able to identify which commitments if, to building sector actions in NDCs are, uh, are um, ambitious and on track to achieve the Paris Agreement targets. And so the objectives of the project were to find out uh, which of the, the building sector actions and commitments we could consider as front runners. In other words, uh, uh, are looking complete and looking uh, like they are able to be um, implemented. We wanted to identify the criteria that would enable us to to determine which which commitments were uh, were what we call front runners, and we wanted to try and develop an online tool which would support countries to in, to uh, be able to find the commitments that were being made by other countries, and to use that as a way of learning and exchanging uh, and sharing knowledge about building sector actions, and in that way. Uh, encourage more ambition and uh, more engagement with the building sector to reduce emissions. So the next slide, please. So the project has two components. The first component is a Delphi study, uh, which was managed um, by Monash University. And uh, it, the Delphi was to um, identify which criteria would identify front runner commitments to, to building sector actions. So we have 13 experts from around the world which joined a panel and we ran a, a, uh, a Delphi process of uh, two rounds, well, three rounds, but the third round was uh, as a workshop and we developed a consensus on what would really be the criteria that would define uh, a good set of commitments to building sector actions. Next slide, please, Jonathan. So the first thing that the committee developed a consensus on was what do we mean when we talk about a front runner commitment? And so this is the consensus position so far, that a front runner commitment is one which aims to achieve an emission reduction goal, which is aligned with the Paris Agreement targets, that links subnational actions with national ambition, including adaptation that expresses an implementation pathway or roadmap and is based on stakeholder engagement. Next slide, thanks, Jonathan. So 
that was the 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 overall front runner um, uh, definition, if you like. And then the commi- the committee of experts developed uh, these eleven criteria, which we are planning on using to help describe in more detail the commitments that countries are making to building sector actions. And so just to, I'm, I'm going to quickly run through what we mean by each of these criteria uh, on the screen and then leave you with some next steps. So the first one is political commitment. And what, we, what we're looking for here is um, that the, the NDC expresses the lead ministry or department that um, is going to take responsibility for ensuring that the, the commitment is implemented. And it's very important that, that the commitment communicates clearly who is taking public responsibility for making the commitment and its implementation. So most NDCs have a very broad um, uh, political commitment and they're often describing the overarching um, responsibility of ministries to achieving the goals of the NDC in general. And what we're hoping we can do over time is encourage countries to also uh, identify which are the, uh, the ministries which are um, responsible for ensuring that the building sector commitments are achieved. The second criteria is on stakeholder engagement. And this criteria identifies if a participatory process has been mentioned as leading to the commitments or actions being expressed in the NDC. Stakeholder engagement and inclusion is often implied in the language of NDCs, uh, but some NDCs do actually provide more detail than others on who was engaged in developing the building sector actions and how they're going to be involved in implementation of them. The third criteria is about sector specific targets and This is one that I think, uh, generally speaking, across all of the NDCs uh, could um, be improved. And that sector-specific target means that the NDC building sector actions set measurable uh, measurable actions for climate um, and, and emissions mitigation that are related specifically to the building sector. You know, so when we look at NDCs, targets are often expressed as overarching to do with the whole the, the national reduction in energy demand or the national reduction in emissions. But it's interesting to see where we could see a mitigation goal or target that's applied to the building sector actions that are being committed to. The, the next one is ambitious goals. An ambitious goal is one which is aligned with the Paris Agreement target of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees relative to national circumstances is aligned with human settlements pathway goals, including adaptation and resilience, and aligned with and supports the most ambitious non-state active building climate commitments in the country. That third point is something that I think we can explore a little bit more with the panelists today. And that is that, you know, many national national commitments are are less ambitious than some of the sub-national or private sector commitments being made particularly in the, in the time frame being set for achieving net zero emissions. The next criteria is about roadmaps. So this is an important um, criteria because it's where the commitment lays out the actions uh, that, uh, and, the, and the milestones which are going to be used to monitor progress towards achieving the, the goals of the commitment. And in particular, we're looking to see with the roadmap um, milestones are leading towards zero emissions and by what date. We're looking also in the next criteria of for policy frameworks. So a policy framework should be in place in order to enable the implementation of NDC commitments to be enforceable. This criteria would be achieved if the commitment included a description of the mechanisms that make achieving the commitment legally enforceable. The next criteria is comprehensive actions. And this criteria assesses the range of actions that capture the largest whole of life mitigation opportunities in the building sector, as well as influence the mainstream just transition to resilient low carbon construction value chains and markets. So we see across NDCs uh, uh, building sector actions which may be expressed um, or, or implied by, for example, 
targets to reduce emissions from the cement industry or the steel industry as, as well as from building operations. So we're looking for that whole of life uh, scope. Uh, then we have moved to coordinating bodies. This criteria applies to commitments that mention the agency that's going to take responsibility for the implementation of actions and achieving the goals. And we're looking to see if it indicates vertical and horizontal integration between different levels of government that are required to implement the building sector actions. In the next criteria, we look at financing. So the commitment should describe the means of financing the commitment and or the amount of finance even that, that um, or other resources that are needed to see that those commitments implemented. We then move to measurement reporting verification and evaluation, uh, as well as data transparency. And so this criteria is looking to see that the commitments based on measurable, reportable and verifiable baselines, scenarios or targets, that it describes how progress will be evaluated, such as an intention to implement periodic monitoring and auditing of progresses against stated targets, and is transparent about the process of data collection and analysis. And then finally, education knowledge and knowledge sharing and this criteria applies when a commitment mentions strategies or initiatives to support knowledge sharing capacity building and uh, formal and informal education programs to enable stakeholders to implement the stated actions so these are 11 criteria that um, by by international expert consensus uh, we um, we are using to develop this tool and uh, be able to provide a much richer description of the, the building sector actions which are being included in the NDCs. And I think what's really important about this is that um, by providing an easier way for, for us all to, uh, to find out what countries are targeting in terms of building sector climate actions, it gives the international community a much better chance of um, providing the right kind of support to the countries to see that those commitments are being turned into accomplishments. Next slide, Jonathan. So this is just to say thank you to the panel of experts that has been involved in the project so far. Uh, I would stress that we are at a point now where we've developed criteria, but we haven't developed a methodology for really assessing the NDCs. And so this is an ongoing project um, but we, with these criteria, we've been able to provide the first step in developing the, the tool which identifies the building sector actions that countries are making and gives us, I think, um, for the first time, a much easier way of being able to share information and knowledge about building sector actions across the world and how they can best be implemented. Thank you, Jonathan. Back to you. Thank you, Peter, for... This good explanation, I'm sorry, I started a little bit fast, but I didn't really have time to uh, prepare that properly. But you actually mentioned, you know, a very important number of elements in terms of the criteria that are very much aligned to the approach that we are pushing with the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction. So that was very much uh, appreciated, you know, how much we are pushing for commitments vision in the countries, stakeholder engagement, everybody needs to work together if you want to transform the sector. And of course, seeing the actions behind that also uh, being materialized. I think um, this was all very important. Now, our next panel member actually is from uh, Egypt. And uh, as part of the development of this tool, we've actually been working with uh, uh, three uh, countries. Um, and Egypt being one of them. We had Egypt, Morocco, and uh, the Emirates actually as the three countries that we were working to actually check how the tool uh, would be measuring, let's say the performance uh, of commitments in the countries. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ashraf Kamal uh, to give us uh, some insights on you know, the building sector commitments in Egypt and what support need and what recommendations they make uh, to, 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 to the others about this. So I'll uh, move to the slides, please. And yes. Thank you, Jonathan. It's uh, my pleasure to be among this uh, distinguished uh, list of panelists. And um, thank you, the audience. Um, yes, we have been in contact with um, the team since, I think, uh, six, seven months. And we had uh, 
chats and uh, discussions about uh, the situation of building sector in, in Egypt. And um, uh, in fact, uh, the indices uh, has been uh, developed uh, in the year 2015, and uh, it's just updated on June 2020, um, more or less one month after issuing the National Climate Change Strategy. And it followed, the indices followed the two major issues, the, the National Climate Change Policies, like the Sustainable Development Strategies, uh, the vision of Egypt for the year 2030, uh, the Long-Term Low Emission Development Strategy, and National Climate Strategy, and Disaster Risk Reduction, and Adaptation to Climate Change. And on the other hand, the, the sectoral strategies that might intersect with these National Climate Change Strategies, like the Sustainable Energy Strategy, then you have the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, which has been um, studied and analyzed by um, a project that I am um, handling in Egypt um, related to the Foreign Ministry of the Environment in Germany. Um, we have the Water Resource Plan, the Solid Waste and uh, Agriculture Development Strategies. Next, please. Um, to, to give a highlight, the NDC is uh, had the revision about the mitigation and adaptation land measures reported in the first issue and revisited the potential mitigation and adaptation actions categorized by sectors over this uh, seven years period from uh, 2015 to 2022. And um, the projection from business as usual, which is the ordinary um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the year 2030 and uh, the quantifications required to just me measure the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction related to the implementation of this strategy and other issues related to um, facilitating clarity, transparency and understanding and disseminating information. Next, please. Um, some of the initiatives like improving the, for instance, the transport system, which I, I picked up from the NDCs, it's a huge uh, number of, uh, of initiatives, like um, some related to uh, tourism, some related to transport, some related to building sector, some related to agriculture, fisheries, and uh, every other uh, aspect of, uh, of development, uh, but focusing on what is related to uh, NDCs related to building sector, like the expansion of uh, metro network uh, in Egypt or uh, Alexandria and the new capital, uh, inserting the light rail transit system, which is about to operate, and the transformation of the public buses from um, high emission to low carbon intensive fuel. Um, uh, upgrading the, the standards of living of citizens and access to clean fuel, uh, low investment on energy efficiency measures. This is the, the, the highlights and the initiatives that has been settled in the indices and confirmed by by the National Climate Change Strategy, um, uh, uh, avoiding accumulating the plastic waste, the production of green uh, petrochemicals and agricultural drainage on mega cities related to treatment plan. Land. Next, please. In fact, we have we have many challenges in Egypt, like um, I was discussing with the some colleagues earlier about the new buildings, which is easier than the existing building. The indices highlighted the existing building, building which is a huge amount of, of, of dwellings. It's more than 25 million dwellings in, in Egypt as an official number. So, uh, I, I will, I will I'll speak about two issues. The new building is, is easier because we are we have the renewable energy and energy efficiency news, which is uh, now it's it's being mandatory and like in the new capital and the new developments of uh, new cities, uh, labeling the, for the energy efficiency and specification. It's now done for appliances, and we are in the process of labeling this for the building material. Of course, it's a long way, but we we just started and. It's ambitious, but we are not in hurry. We, we, we know it will take some time, but we will uh, we have a plan to, to do this. Um, promoting the green buildings, which uh, HBRC, our Housing and Building National Research Center, had issued the first green pyramids rating system for, uh, for Egyptian building, and um, other committees uh, had issued uh, green hospital rating systems. 
And it's still not mandatory and needs some incentives and some enforcements, which I will speak shortly about it. Uh, adaptation and renovation of the existing building, which is hard, but we, we can simplify our codes and our uh, uh, norms to, to cope with the existing building because it's, as, as I said, it's a huge amount of, of uh, resources we have. Uh, in, increase the, the insertion of green spaces and sustainable parks and uh, having the active mobility strategy to encourage use of bicycle and walking, which we have uh, inaugurated the first bike system in, in Cairo, um, I think a couple of weeks ago. Uh, shifting to electrical vehicles, it's on the way, and I, I see uh, our colleagues in, in Sharm Sheikh can, can see this now, it's uh, reality, shifting from normal uh, fuel to uh, electric and gas fuel, and uh, adoptation, adopting solar panels and operating uh, uh, new system for lighting and advert advertisement. Next, please. We have, um, just to conclude, we have an anticipated challenges like the policy mechanism and institutional arrangements, which is hard to achieve, but it's, it's not impossible. Um, some agreement with international entities like we like the one we have today, and um, above all, the capacity building for those who will monitor, in, uh, monitor and uh, uh, advice about uh, technology transfer, about the applications, and of course the financial support. Of course, there is uh, an ambition estimation for the conditional cost for mitigation and adaptation for more than almost 250 billion US dollars. However, in HBRC we have some challenges like the availability and mechanism for finance, setting the policy. It's uh, Part of, its, uh, of, of this policy lay, lay, laid on HPRC since the institutional system comes from our side. Um, we are experienced in capacity building for over 25 years. We have been graduating uh, many officials, many uh, 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 local staff and uh, many university uh, staff related to capacity building and technology transfer, including the scientific research and dissemination of data and info. Um, one of our great challenge nowadays is the simplification of the energy efficiency code we have. It's uh, brilliant in terms of science, uh, but it's it's uh, hard to achieve in terms of uh, business model. Um, I hope I, I'm, I'm not taking so long and um, let's uh, retreat for if, uh, if you have any question or uh, remarks uh, we can discuss along the presentation thank you thank, thank you dr ashraf i good to good to see the commitments from the egyptian government specifically on the energy side renewable energy energy efficiency mentioning about the codes you mentioned codes are nice but implementation codes is a challenge and it's not a challenge only i would say in countries like egypt it can even be a challenge in europe so it's not it's a challenge overall to kind of get the cost and for enforced i would say overall you also mentioned quite a bit about transport um, and i think if we are moving towards electric vehicles buildings will have a very important role because actually they will have to power the vehicles also so it's important to integrate this i don't know energy into the building so that actually you can charge your batteries of your car also at the building sites. Um, so I think they have an important part in this uh, transformation of the, of the transport sector also. But uh, thank you very much. I will now invite Jamila Herharisi to actually talk about Morocco's commitments in the building sector and share uh, the recommendations that they have on their site. Thank you, Jonathan. Jamila, if you are online, Hi. it's over to you. You hear me? Hi, good morning. Good morning, we can hear you. Good, good morning, your sound is very faint, Jamila. Hi, no, no? Is it better? Then, then Good morning. Would you just, then just raise your voice a little bit? Okay. Hi. It's okay now. It's okay? Okay. 
Uh, hi everyone, I, want, I would like to thank you all for inviting me to this event on uh, NBC2. I would like to thank the Global ABC for uh, associating us in this important work and all ex experts involved in this project. Okay. Jamila, excuse me. I don't know whether no. you can increase the sound on your side of the of the microphone okay. because we can hear you, but not very loud. Or I would kindly ask you to speak very loudly if you can. <laughs> okay. Hi. You hear me better? Better now? It's still a bit faint, but I guess if there's not much you can do, then unfortunately. We should probably go ahead. So I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me in this uh, in this panel uh, on NDC tool. I would like to thank the Global ABC for associating us in this important work uh, and all the experts involved in this project. First of all, I would like to present the Moroccan context uh, of the building sector. Uh, so the building sector is, is the second consumer of energy after transport with a part of 33% of the top, total energy, uh, final energy consumption, 25% uh, for residential and 8% for tertiary. The building sector in Morocco is responsible uh, for 12% of energy-related emissions. For energy uh, consumption, butane is consumed the most, especially for cooking with a percentage, percentage of 79%, followed by uh, electricity, the major part of which is consumed by refrigerators, 45%. Uh, thus, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Jonathan. Yes, Jamil, I can hear you, but it's just the remote that is not working. So okay. <laughs> I'm trying to push it. Okay. There are similar strategies in terms of energy uh, efficiency and sustainability have been uh, adopted, which include the building sector, especially the energy efficiency strategy, which has set energy saving targets of uh, 20% by uh, 2013, uh, with a part of 40% uh, of the building sector. Also, the national strategy of sustainability adopted in 2017 has, has set an objective for the promotion of eco-conception eco and the long-term low-carbon strategy includes actions related to the building sector. The qualitative uh, phase of this strategy is uh, have been developed and its quantitative phase in under development. On the legal and the regulatory framework, Morocco has adopted the law on energy efficiency, which was followed by the development of the first general uh, regulation of Morocco. Next slide, please. Uh, for the new uh, national determined contribution of Morocco, that was submitted in 2021. The ambition of Morocco has been raised compared to the first one, the first one that was submitted in 2016. Thus, the new target in the, uh, is the, the reduction of 45.5% uh, uh, of greenhouse gas emission by 2030. 18.3% uh, of this target is unconditional, uh, and uh, the uh, remaining 27% uh, are conditional to international assistance. The part of building sector in this target is 6%, is 6, uh, 6%. and the uh, uh, measurement, uh, reporting, and verification uh, system is being developed. Uh, so, for the building sector, uh, next slide, please. Uh, for the building sec uh, sector, the actions listed in the NDC are indicative uh, and concern both the building env uh, envelope and the equipment and are divided into unconditional and conditional action. The reduction potential of the building sector is more than 24,000 gigagram, gigagram CO2. 
Also, the novelty of this, uh, in compared the, uh, of first one, the, to the first one, is the adaptation component, uh, which has been strengthened in this NDC. So, the building sector is also included in this in the adaptation part uh, of the new NDC. Also, uh, in the next slide, in alignment with the objectives of uh, the NDC, a mitigation plan has been developed by identifying. 10 mitigation actions and an envelope and equipment, and an adaptation plan in a region of northern Morocco uh, on the basis of uh, a study of climate risks in the region has also been developed. I would also like to, uh, to mention the pilot, uh, some pilot projects uh, we are working on with our national and international partners. Uh, next slide. Partners. Uh, the first project is Building Passports project in partnership with the Global EDC. Uh, so Building Passports is a digital register uh, that collects different, different types of data and information related to the building sec uh, sector uh, and or, uh, in order to improve the quality uh, in the construction uh, sector. Also, uh, concept notes of two projects are being prepared for submission to the Green Climate Fund the pilot projects for energy uh, efficient housing and, in, uh, and thermal rehabilitation of the exist, uh, existing housing stock in partnership with the Center for Climate Change and in the, in the Also, as part, uh, as part of the adapt adaptation plan, a concept note of a regional project with Egypt to strengthen the resi resilience to climate change of res residential neighborhoods. Is being developed in partnership with UN Abita for submission to the adaptation plan. The last project I would like to mention is the project uh, involving the living condition of uh, real households in many new areas affected, affected by climate change, which is a pilot project targeting the deep rural mountainous areas that are experiencing difficult climate conditions. It aims to improve the living condition of this, the, the residents uh, of these territories and reduce the impacts of climate change. Uh, next, next slide, please. To conclude, I would like to share with, uh, with you some perspective of our actions we entered, uh, entered to work on. Uh, so uh, we want to work on strengthening the regulatory regulatory and normative framework to promote the use of local materials and process, uh, the use of innovative materials and process, and evaluation the application of the thermal regulation and its uh, updating, uh, and also for water management in the residential, uh, residential sector. For funding and initiatives, uh, we want to develop funding mechanism Seizing the opportunities offered by climate finance by setting, and, uh, setting up uh, bankable projects, developing initiative mechanisms for energy and uh, efficiency uh, and water saving in buildings. Uh, also, among our, uh, among our, our objectives is, devo uh, is developing projects for energy efficiency, new housing, energy and thermal rehabilitation of the existing residential stock, pilot projects for water efficiency uh, buildings. Uh, and in terms of uh, partnership and collab collaboration, we work on strengthening the collabor co collaboration and joint action between the various the different st stakeholders in the building sector, developing international partnership action, and uh, strengthening South South uh, cooperation on sustainability, sustainability. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jamila, and, and sorry, it was not easy for me to switch all the slides, but uh, we managed. Uh, very good to hear that, you know, from uh, the Moroccan side, I can, we can see quite strong commitments and a very clear direction of where you want to go. Um, and you, you mentioned issues related to adaptation that were not mentioned earlier, and I think adaptation is also a critical issue mm -hmm. to look into when we look at the buildings and construction sector overall. From the two presentations that we had on the countries, I think if I think about the previous session that we had, the issue of embodied carbon or materials is not coming up yet that strongly. So I mean, it shows that 
I think what we said earlier that most of the countries certainly know about the whole issue about renewable energy, energy efficiency, and really started to take action toward this, even if you know there's still quite a need and quite a number of challenges. But it really shows that that's the path that has been focused on for quite some time, this operational energy, and that now there's a need to start moving into the next phase where we also look at the embodied carbon-related uh, issues. And, and there I know, um, with the work that we are doing in Morocco, looking at the building passport, is actually also trying to see how we can uh, look at this specific issue um, um, through, the, through that tool. Thank you. So um, I will now invite Dr. Sunita Purukshotan, please, to uh, join. I mean, I, I'll give you my microphone, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I have a few slides. Yeah. So I'll stand here because it's easier. Um, so uh, I represent Mahindra Life Spaces. Uh, I head sustainability for Mahindra Life Spaces. We are a developer uh, into two specific types of development, uh, integrated cities and industrial clusters and residential properties. Uh, residential segment, we, are we look at affordable, mid-segment, and premium as well. So that's the entire range of work we do, and uh, that sets us uh, you know, on uh, a path where we have been pioneering sustainability in the real estate sector. So I just want to provide uh, uh, an overview of uh, you know, some of the commitments that the corporate sector can take. and. Uh, can I have the? <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. So um, it's complicated, ESG commitments. And, uh, and I would like to put more on, uh, you know, S and G as we progress further. Uh, this is very environment heavy. But nevertheless, it's a complex uh, set of commitments to navigate. and. Uh, I wanted to share that we are the first and only real estate company in India to have science-based targets approved uh, in 2019. And uh, there are a few more who have, uh, you know, wanting to commit uh, and get their targets approved uh, to SBTI. Uh, SBTI uh, commitment here focuses on our operational carbon emissions, operational carbon emissions, and it covers scope one and scope two, 63% reduction in absolute emissions by 2033, 20% uh, reduction on scope three. However, we have actually taken a more stringent scope three uh, target uh, around our buildings and we have gone ahead and said that we are in for decarbonizing our built uh, environment uh, by 2030 all new developments will be uh, net zero so that's the uh, commitment for all new developments uh, the other uh, uh, group level target we are part of uh, Mahindra group and it's uh, about reaching carbon neutrality uh, by 2040 so 10 years ahead of uh, reaching our carbon neutrality, our buildings and all new developments need to be uh, net zero. And that's very difficult and we are building a roadmap for that. Uh, while operational energy and uh, waste um, uh, targets could be slightly easier to uh, achieve, what we are finding very difficult to do is to uh, figure out what we have to do around uh, becoming net zero water. And that's a very critical problem because of the density of development, the availability of rainfall, the acceptance of recycled water, and so on. So bringing that into the carbon picture as well, because if you make your buildings water efficient, actually you're reducing carbon because that the pumping energy and the cleaning energy that is associated. So the energy water nexus really needs to be explored deeply. Uh, of course, uh, zero waste to landfill. One of our cities is uh, certified zero waste to landfill. Uh, and uh, we aim to achieve water positivity uh, for our developments. We're looking, exploring how we can go about doing that. Uh, aligned to uh, the group, we have two major commitments, which is on planting trees and uh, 
uh, you know, empowering the girl child and empowering women. These are the other initiatives that uh, focus on the social side, but a lot more can be done around the uh, labor related work. And there is, there are projects in pipeline that we are working on to uh, around migrant uh, labor uh, uh, and their problems and how we can uh, channelize government related initiative towards them. Yeah, so this is our approach to planet positive uh, uh, developments. So th how are we going to meet these targets? It's about uh, how we look at demand reduction, energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy usage, adopting material circularity, uh, reduce reuse and get more uh, carbon uh, positive materials uh, into our buildings, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, harvest uh, water and ensuring zero waste to landfill. Uh, decarbonizing our supply chain, we don't want to limit all our learnings to us. We want to influence our supply chain and influence further as well. And I'll talk about it, how we are going about influencing, uh, going beyond our own supply chain to the entire sector. Uh, accelerate the EV transition uh, and look at how we uh, also make the construction part uh, efficient because that's very difficult looking at the extensive use of diesel and electricity while we construct. Um, and uh, one of the key things that we've been working on is looking at rejuvenating nature. Uh, biodiversity studies have now become a part of our work uh, because how do we, uh, during the construction phase, protect the biodiversity at site and also enhance the biodiversity through positive development. So uh, materials and technology are key. So sustainability and technology are two key pillars that the organization has adopted for uh, its strategy for uh, developing uh, and building its huge portfolio. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we have gone beyond the uh, supply chain. This is through a charter uh, that we have developed in collaboration with uh, World Resource Institute, AEEE, and EcoCollab. Uh, what we realized is keeping it amongst ourselves will not help. Uh, and if you really need to pioneer something, you need to influence and go beyond your own organization. And that's we need help, we need to collaborate, we need to get every stakeholder of the real estate industry into this, uh, in the same room so that we can collaborate and understand uh, how we can work on various different challenges that we saw in the, uh, that the previous speakers referred to. So uh, we developed a business charter and this has six priority actions where we brought in uh, science-based targets as one of the uh, action areas uh, designing net zero buildings uh, uh, also, improved operational efficiency for net zero buildings, uh, mainstreaming low carbon materials, look at who are the vendors who will be able to come in and demonstrate carbon positive alternative materials, uh, and mainstream codes and uh, standards, uh, and enable the monitor monitoring and tracking performance of net zero buildings. So, uh, anybody in the value chain can sign up. There are uh, about 16 signatories and anybody, I mean, it could be a design firm, it could be a contracting firm, it could be a developer, it could be a big company like a IT company which has a lot of real estate, a lot of um, assets, uh, sorry, commercial estates, I would say. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, they can sign up because it's about creating better buildings and better uh, infrastructure uh, so that, you know, Everybody is sharing. We have a lot to learn uh, and share. It could be a material vendor. It could be a contractor. So India has about 82,000 developers who are in uh, RICs uh, registered. There could be many more. Uh, imagine only one of them has approved science-based target. And uh, there are a few more, but you can just count it in your fingers. They are in the lower, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. So how do you mobilize the sector? 
There are around 1,20,000 registered contractors. How do you get them to adopt uh, sustainability and ESG into their working? Because uh, are we looking at uh, rewarding the behaviors that are unsustainable practices uh, that are cheaper currently and uh, in the long run are going to cause a lot of angst uh, for both the people and the planet? So that's what we hope we can influence and change. Uh, we wanted to talk about how it is important to focus on research. Um, so uh, quite some time back, uh, in around 2015, we, uh, you know, established a partnership with Terry uh, to, f you know, to fund through uh, on developing uh, energy efficient, uh, you know, buildings in India. The vision was to develop energy efficient buildings. Uh, and to make it available, what materials, what is the U-value of the materials, what is the resistivity of the material, to be tested out in a laboratory. Uh, there is a dearth of good laboratories. This is an NABL accredited laboratory. Uh, we wanted it to, uh, wanted this laboratory to be open for all. It is an open, res uh, open resource. Uh, all the uh, materials are available online. It's called the Mahindra Terry Center of Excellence. We have people from Terry here. Uh, Sanjay, Sh Sanjay Shet and Shabnam Basi are here. They are, uh, you know, our partners here for this laboratory. And uh, it is accredited. And uh, we are looking at uh, wanting to communicate more about this, uh, you know, at various forums so that everybody can look at it, use the work that is happening here, send materials for testing, because alternative materials need to be tested and they have to be fit for purpose. So where do you go and test them? So that's also important, uh, you know, a missing uh, link. Uh, there are few laboratories who have uh, the ability to test uh, uh, what needs to be done. So we also looked at adding uh, water use in habitats and we looked at three assessments of, uh, you know, deep assessments in cities. We looked at Chennai, Gurgaon, and Pune for water and uh, uh, wanted to understand the linkage between water and climate change and how cities should be able to, uh, you know, plan, measure, uh, and manage water resources uh, through these studies and look at the scale of the problem that we are dealing with in terms of water. Uh, yeah. So these are some of the things uh, that uh, I wanted to share, and uh, the the it is a call for everybody uh, in the sector to commit because the commitment is the first thing uh, for action. And this COP is about implementation. You will get to implement only if you commit. So even if you, uh, you know, getting up in the morning is also a commitment towards yourself, <laughs> and you have to put it in your mind and say say it to somebody that you know, mom, I'm going to get up in the morning. Please wake me up. Or you say it to yourself that, I mean, I'm talking in context of my son, uh, or you say it to yourself that I'm going to get up. So that's a commitment that you make. So it's time to get up, wake up, and take action. And commitment is the right, uh, right beginning for action and get to implementation very quickly. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sunita. Um, actually, I mean, I can see that there's very strong commitment. It's good to see commitment from the private sector. Uh, I mean, we're talking about governments. We talked about governments, but without the private sector on board, we won't get there. And often the private sector can play a very strong championing role, which we can see here. And what I also very much appreciate is what you were saying earlier about engaging the others, because it's not only one actor that can make the change happen. And taking the others with you is actually a very great approach to, to make the transformation happen. Since we're very much delayed on time, and I'm sorry about that, <laughs> um, I will move to uh, Dr. Diana Kroll to talk about the net zero commitments or net zero building commitments of Monash University. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. I'll get you to move the slides for me, if that's okay. Okay, fine. Anyway, it's uh, lovely to be here. I'm Diane Kral from uh, Monash University. And I'd like to share with you the Net Zero Initiative at my university, uh, Monash, uh, in Victoria, Australia. 
And round about 2017, we uh, became the first university to commit uh, globally for net zero and um, on our campuses by 2030. And our climate action commitment basically brought about a, an award by the UN which was conferred in 2018 and it was called the Momentum for Change Award. And essentially we um, got commitments for 135 million Australian dollars to put in place energy efficiency, campus electrification, on-site and off-site renewables, net zero ready buildings, an intelligent energy network and offsets for any residual emissions. So that's the, the frame for our uh, net zero initiative. And so at the university, where is it that all our emissions come from? Well, round about 67% of our emissions are from uh, coal-fired electricity. We use coal to generate electricity in Victoria. And the rest is from uh, emissions from gas. We use gas to heat our boilers on campus and it uh, basically produces hot water and heating and cooling. So that's the, um, the energy footprint there. Next slide. So we had this problem of um, the university generating uh, these carbon emissions and we also looked at our targets going out to 2030. So in terms of students, we're predicting that we'll be getting at about 80,000 students by 2030, and that requires extra buildings and extra support staff. And if we had have kept on the path of coal-fired electricity and gas, uh, we would be um, in a very uh, uh, dire situation. So basically we decide through this initiative to reduce our energy consumption to 400,000 gigajoules by 2030 and also to ramp up our renewable energy to 100%. So 100% renewable energy, that's our target by 2030. And that's the basis for our uh, net zero um, initiative. So more students, more buildings, so we had to reduce. And again, uh, building configuration, energy efficiency, campus electrification, on-site and off-site renewables, and offsetting uh, residual emissions. So I've just got a, a few little uh, notes here I want to share with you about our Net Zero initiative. So we are Australia's largest uh, university, and of course, we've now committed to uh, get to Net Zero by 2030. And not to, not to forget, we have been decarbonising our campus uh, since 2005. And it's through innovations and partnerships that Monash has embarked on this deep decarbonisation journey, integrating research and teaching in the process. And in particular, Monash's approach consists of a strong emphasis on transforming our campus buildings that can be replicated well beyond campus boundaries and innovating how we store and use our energy. We store our energy at the moment, our renewable energy on a giant battery on campus and also by engaging our local communities to help create a clean future. So, okay, we're a university that's trying to decarbonise but what's so unique about the Monash approach? Well, we're the first university to issue a climate bond. And so far we've raised, in Australian dollars, 285 million, so that's not bad. And so the net uh, carbon initi initiative is designed to make the university's buildings what we call living laboratories. And so we're better designing our building under high performance passive house principles to continue best practice, sustainability and comfort. We've been replacing our inefficient gas boilers with electric pumps and our thermal um, building pr uh, precincts are being made more efficient. 
in regards to heating and cooling of the campus. We've also gained funding from state and federal governments as well as industry to develop a market leading microgrid. So we've got a microgrid on campus, which will be exciting. So what have been the, the short term results of this initiative? Uh, particularly, you know, in the early days from about 2018. Well, first of all, uh, we implemented 11,000 LED lights across all our campuses, so that was um, uh, quite big. We've installed um, more than 4,000 solar panels uh, to bring our existing rooftop solar capacity to two megawatts, enough to power 320 average Australian households. And there are plans back in 2018 for 7,100 extra solar panels or four megawatts of energy. We've also signed, uh, at the time, a long-term power purchase agreement with a regional wind farm. So we're bringing in wind from a regional area. Uh, we've commenced a rollout of th uh, thermal precinct electrification strategy with upgrades, uh, both in the medicine and science precinct. We've installed a state-of-the-art one megawatt hybrid uh, energy storage system on campus. We've, some, we've installed uh, electric vehicle charging facilities. And of course, we're building uh, a market leading microgrid on our Clayton campus. So that was back in 2018. Those were the, uh, the, the quick initiatives. And what about our more recent projects uh, process since um, uh, 2022? So currently we have a biomedical learning and teaching building, which is our first climate bond certified lab. We have the Woodside building for technology and design, which is the largest educational passive house building in the world and it's microgrid connected. We've got the new chancellery, which has uh, passive house design principles, artificial intelligence optimization and microgrid interactivity. And not forgetting our student residence, uh, Gillies Hall. It's the first large scale building in Australia designed with passive house principles. So Monash has also been progressively upgrading its uh, net zero plan for decarbonisation since 2018. So things such as matching our renewable energy supply to our demand side profile. So what's next? So Monash is working with industry, government and other jurisdictions to communicate the lessons learned from our net zero initiative and to encourage other entities to undertake similar initiatives. So I'll just go back to the slides here. So, okay, so for everyone out there, you can get your own journey started. And it's a three-point plan. So first of all, mapping out a creditable and deliverable implementation concept. Identify the benefits and risk mitigation opportunities. And also you've got to leverage your influences and leaders to reach, to reach these public targets. So this dynamic and progressive implementation approach will mean there'll be a leverage of quick wins using existing processes. There'll be a grab of early mover benefits. You'll be able hopefully to establish market leadership and also there should always be innovation through external partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Diane. It's very inspiring to see, <laughs> you know, the commitments made by the university and how, yeah, what actions you've been taking and especially also showing, demonstrating the solutions and making them available to others. So it was very good to see these two presentations that actually showed private sector or uh, let's say outside of what the government does also that other actors are really taking action and, and, 
yeah, bringing the community forward on the buildings and construction sector. So um, I will now we don't have that much time left, but uh, the, we introduced this session by saying that we are developing a tool. And so I would like to invite uh, Craig Burton to actually present the built environment specific commitment tool that is under development. Um, right. Thank you, Jonathan. Take us to the next slide, if you like. I'm going to um, introduce this tool by describing the process we went through to develop. So as Peter said before, we ran a project to determine um, new criteria for um, buildings related NDC commitments. And two of the people um, in the panel of four that informed the tool designer with us today um, in today's event, um, Ms. Al-Harizi and Dr. Kamal, uh, along with a volunteer from um, the United Arab Emirates and Canada. Um, go forward a slide, please. All right, I I'll keep going. Room. I think we might have lost the room. Okay. Nope. There we go. It's good. Thank you. Um, so the the diagram shows basically there were a rounds of user centered design. So um, we interacted with the representatives from the four countries to determine the challenges that they were having uh, in decarbonizing their building sectors and also the opportunities. And then uh, we took these uh, this information away and it was used to formulate further questions to define what kind of tool would serve these people. So the U UX panel, the group of four countries, were really playing the role of future uh, users of this tool. Um, next slide, please. And this is the way the tool appears at the moment. So it's a prototype. Um, the final tool, which will be built in a later phase of the project, would ask you first for your preferred language and region of interest. In this case, it's showing MENA and the hosts of um, COP27. And the way the tool works is it uh, colors the map um, based on different countries' NDC commitments, including buildings. And um, the the uh, drop down at the right is shown and it's the uh, WGBC roadmap. So there's a roadmap for decarbonization of the building sector and it breaks the building sector down into new buildings, old buildings, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, materials. And so the future tool will allow you to select one of these things and then see the map recolored and you'll access the data pertinent to that part of the um, of the roadmap. Um, to go further, you just click on one of the countries. In this case, you click on the name um, uh, Egypt. Do you want to take us forward a slide, please? And here uh, it shows the um, built environment related uh, criteria for Egypt. And there's all, um, all of them are listed down the right hand side, all 11. So if you scroll, you see them all. Um, it also allows you to uh, click and find out about emissions. And if you take us one uh, slide further, here is the information that comes up. So what's taken here is an example from financing, which is one of these new criteria. And it's a grab from the NDC or uh, the translation or a summary at the top. There'll be a future link explaining how these commitments are um, judged in terms of their um, abatement potential. And then at the bottom in the blue box is a kind of a value add, a bit like the climate action tracker where an expert comments on the country's commitments and the potential for um, more action. Can you go down one further? And this uh, tool here, which is what you get when you click on the um, emissions for uh, Egypt, it shows the potential for decarbonization. So the orange line at the top is the business as usual line. That's the bad line. It shows the emissions if uh, there are no special commitments made to building decarbonization. And at the right, there's a cost shown. So the cost uh, shown in this particular mock-up 
is a very large number. It's the cost of not doing anything uh, to decarbonize buildings. But fortunately, in this example, Egypt has two commitments, one in 2015 and one just recently. And that creates the two series green and blue going down to the right towards zero. Um, and the cost of implementing them is uh, a figure that's illustrative from us. It's certainly lower than the cost of no action. And then down at the very bottom, there's a yellow circle. This is uh, the cost of getting to zero. So the tool would model these things. And what it shows you is that earlier commitments uh, cost less and the overall cost of decarbonizing buildings uh, is something that we can model. It's reasonable and decarbonization is rapid. One more slide, please. Okay, and thanks very much for that. And you can visit the tool and the supporting information um, at the QR code on the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to sit next to the speaker because I have very much difficulties hearing with all the sound around, so it makes it a bit difficult. But uh, thanks very much for showing us the tool. We actually have not that much time left uh, to um, have a real panel discussion, uh, but we still have about 16 minutes. So um, maybe uh, I can ask uh, both Sunita and Diane maybe to sit here in the front, and uh, then we have all our panel members on the screen plus. Um, very good. So um, maybe I'll just start by asking a question to Ashraf and um, I'd like to, I'm gonna probably focus quite a bit on the tool because that's what we are working on and that's what we would like to take forward. And, uh, and so I would like to, to hear from you Ashraf, like how do you think a tool like this, you know, can help Egypt advancing its ambition overall, uh, you know, in the building sector in terms of commitments? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, as uh, Craig uh, explored, uh, I've been in contact and I have seen this tool and um, I totally agree on it, with, um, which will, will, will help Egypt uh, achieving um, its target of uh, indices on, um, on the building sector. However, we, we still need to, to do some efforts locally uh, regarding the neighboring material and um, achieving like like you said, every rating system is looking for um, what's so called the, the regional material or low carbon, or let's say zero carbon emissions of, of building materials. So I'm supporting this tool 100%. This would be um, quite useful for you to achieve. It started by the year uh, 2034. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. So and very good to hear that, you know, you are very supportive to such a tool being developed and that actually it's something I hope that can help like pushing with a number of the decision makers to understand how, what they can improve and how they can increase their commitments. Um, I'm just, maybe I, I just have a, a small follow-up question for you is like, you know, more on the, on the stakeholder engagement and, and the NDC because I mean even if you have the tool that will be providing you with a pretty good picture you know how do you think you need to engage you know all the stakeholders actually to in, to actually build those commitments um, so um, yeah please uh, and just one small issue may, maybe answering your question is about the business model of this tool it's, it's not uh, creating something scientific and uh, disseminating to the community or the stakeholders, and then they will agree. No, no, it's, it's, it's not working like this. We have been, we have developed our first issue of the energy efficiency code in the year 2005. So it's uh, 17 years and it's not mandatory yet. Um, the reason why it's uh, the, the, the code is scientifically brilliant, but it's not achievable. It's almost doubling the cost of the building. So um, every investor, even the government, is running away from this code. By simplification of the code, which we are recently uh, developing in HPRC, with, because we, we, we have uh, we are the, the entity who, who issued the, the, the first code, we are simplifying the code into like, like uh, steps, like stairs. You cannot climb the, 
10 floors at one at once it's it's really impossible but we can climb step by step um, to achieve to achieve this if we if we look at europe uh, europe spent 40 years and we cannot achieve this in in just four hours or four days so um, we are quite sure that uh, having the business model which part of our stuff one one of them is my is, is myself is is experience in developing this business um, business model and achieving the decision maker with um, what's so called the cost benefit analysis um, what sort of benefits we are going to achieve by applying this world uh, by uh, applying this uh, net zero emission uh, building um, let's say zero carbon emissions um, I mean the whole story and what sort of expenses we are going to pay if we don't do anything because it's it's quite um, let's say uh, quite hard, quite um, scary like uh, let's say that. So the, you can see this uh, this uh, measures of the climate change uh, um, uh, uh, rising sea level um, um, uh, we are we are facing this this um, these changes uh, recently since five six years and uh, okay. it's becoming clear that we need an action and uh, luckily we have uh, these updated indices we have uh, uh, ongoing um, this issuance of national uh, national climate change strategy which has focused on 20 percent of its goals into the scientific research and dissemination of information and engaging of stakeholders not only the community the private sector the industry the uh, scientific research the decision maker into one panel uh, for the country so um I'm, I'm quite confident that we will achieve something. We are used to, to work under pressure and under challenges. This is where we we do our best uh, to achieving uh, something to the to the to the country and to the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashraf, you know, to actually provide more uh, elements about you know the commitment and the engagement of the actors and and how things have already been. Uh, progressing quite a bit over the last years in terms of pushing the, the building energy efficiency agenda overall. Um, unfortunately, I think Jamila had to leave us because I, oh, Jamila, you are back, very good. <laughs> so I actually, uh, the, the next question I wanted to, to ask uh, you uh, in Morocco, and um, you've actually shown a lot of like, you know, the, the, the strong actions that are being put forward and the vision that Morocco has in terms of transforming uh, the building and construction sector. And um, so I, on the one end, you know, we mentioned about the tool and I was asking Dr. Ashraf, okay, so what, what benefit do you see in the tool? And the question I would ask you is like, uh, you know, with the tool actually, um, how do you think the tool can actually help to some extent taking forward some of the ambition actions that Morocco has been putting forward and whether the tool will help uh, in that direction to maybe mobilize some of the partners around the issues or um, so getting your perspective on that. No, I can speak in, in French. You will have to speak up, I think, and speak as loud as you can because we we have difficulties, unfortunately, hearing here in the pavilion because it's very noisy outside. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the tool, uh, it's, uh, it's important to uh, work and uh, we are uh, pleased to, to be uh, in part, uh, in part of it. Uh, so the, the tool, we can, uh, as uh, was uh, uh, presented by Mr. Greg, uh, will help us to, uh, to, to demonstrate the persons of uh, action in the building sector in the indices. So we can compare our action with, with other countries and uh, also uh, can, um, um, uh, can promote. Jamila, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, okay. Maybe there's not much you can do about it and then you can tell me, but it's very, very difficult to hear you. Uh, so I don't know whether there's. And I know no. you tried already. No, it's better. Slightly, but you know, I think we. If 
If it's not possible, then I mean, I, I'll probably move to the next panel member because, <coughs> uh, yeah, it's very, very difficult. Jo actually to Jonathan, hear. can can you can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I could hear mm. Craig very well. Also. I, if I if I may, then because I could hear Jamila perfectly, and and uh, forgive me, Jamila, if I make yeah. a mistake. But uh, what she was saying was that the the tool is uh, useful because it will enable Morocco to compare uh, the building sector actions which are being committed to in Morocco with other countries. It provides a, an important aspect of um, transparency and, um, and uh, generally increasing awareness. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Peter. And, and I hope, Jamila, this was a good representation of what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, maybe I'll go yeah. to uh, Dr. Sunita. I'll have a question for you. And, um, I mean, you've been mentioning about the private sector, but I was wondering, like, from your perspective, seeking the private sector, you know, what support do you need from the policymakers? Uh, it's a large question, I know. <laughs> So, thank you. Uh, definitely need support from the policymakers. Uh, I just wanted to share that uh, we have developed India's first net zero residential building in Bangalore. Uh, there are two aspects of uh, policy that needs to come in immediately. One is on thermally comfortable building envelope and that's the uh, ECBC code for uh, uh, the residential building that needs to be deployed all across the country immediately. So the code is there, it, is, uh, uh, it has to be really notified uh, across all states because a hot country like ours needs the energy efficiency building code immediately. So that's the first support. The other is getting, uh, integrating the uh, renewable energy, uh, the entire uh, crisscrossing across the states, the various, uh, uh, you know, ways in which we can access the grid, grid renewable energy. That needs to be uh, uh, really uh, made, um, you know, easy for end users to be able to access grid renewable energy. So that's the other policy support. It's very complicated to navigate uh, the state level uh, policies uh, to figure out, okay, this works in this state, that doesn't work. So if I have a portfolio to develop, then maybe I will choose not to develop in those states. So what we need is across the country, uh, uniformity around how we can access grid renewable energy and that needs to be measured. Uh, and the other is the energy efficiency code that needs to come in immediately. Net zero buildings are possible now, and we have demonstrated that. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Sunita. I, I like the strong spirit to make it actually happen. So, and uh, yes, certainly the codes. I know in India there is only two states actually that have made them mandatory, so there are a number of other states that really need to get acted on that also, and integration of renewable energy. So thank, thank you very much. Diane, I'm going to ask you um, about, you know, how the work that you're doing and the commitments that you have at the university, actually, uh, what effect does it have in terms of catalyzing action, you know, um, for at state level or nationally? So how, your inf how it influences um, the state or the government to actually act from your perspective? Okay. Well, I, I'm not directly involved in the project. I'm uh, on campus along with, you know, our thousands of other students. And one of the things is we're, we've been very proud of what um, the, the core researchers have been doing on the campus in regards to net zero. It's really, you know, uplifted the, the, the spirit and, and the commitment. And, you know, we're a research university and we've been saying for a long time, where's our contribution? to lowering CO2 emissions. So it's had this beautiful uh, flow on effect uh, to everyone that's you know, engaged on the campus. But in terms of um, how our program, at the Net Zero Initiative, is affecting, say, um, the wider state of Victoria, we've actually got um, three uh, precincts that are replicating our microgrid. So 
we, the campus is a living laboratory and we're sharing our findings with um, others beyond the campus, within the state, and uh, there's even uh, an initiative, I think, in uh, the next state of, of New South Wales. And uh, certainly we've got uh, more government funding, more government interest in what we're doing, and sometimes you have to start small in order to, to reach out and get bigger. Thank you very much. That's a very important element, is like start small, and then actually make the change happen uh, by growing and influencing others and engaging them. So, um, so we are nearly at the end of our uh, session and we have four minutes left, but maybe I wanna turn to my colleagues, Craig, Peter, I don't know who wants to answer, but I would like to kind of get your perspective on what are our next steps now with the tool and you know how we are going to bring it to the next level. So. Mm. Over to you. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks to everybody on the panel and thanks to everybody who has been listening online and in the room and thanks for putting up with the background noise as well. So the next, yeah, the next steps basically for um, developing the tool, as I said, with the criteria, uh, the next steps is to, to work with the experts and work with the countries to develop a method for being able to properly assess the NDC commitments against the criteria and feed that information into the tool and uh, to bring more countries on board. Uh, in the background, you know, across the network of the Global ABC and um, researchers at Monash and other universities, we have a very good understanding now of what uh, building sector actions are included in NDCs. And so uh, there's a, it's really a great opportunity to bring that information forward and make it really accessible through the tool. Um, Craig, do you want to mention next steps or an invitation to, to look at the tool and to, to um, follow up? Yeah, um, sure, I would. It's, um, the tool is, is really intended to be um, um, a, positive, a positive message. So it, there's already interest in uh, commitments in this, in this sector. So as Peter said, there's 158 mentions, countries mentioning buildings already. So the tool is there to provide um, a, a positive message as more and more specific commitments are written for this particular sector. And it should be clear and easy to see this uh, in, in the new tool. And um, so, yeah, I wanna thank the um, Global ABC for uh, supporting this and hopefully we will build this next year. Thank you, Peter, Craig. So I agree, we need more countries to join. So that's really our next step. And so that we can show really more globally where the countries stand with their commitments. And hopefully it will also create a movement between countries, you know, to kind of put more stronger ambitions on the table also when they compare themselves to uh, their, their peers um, and also can learn from the, their peers, I would say, on how to uh, increase their commitments. So, um, with this, I would like to actually thank all the panel members, Dr. Sunita, Diane, thanks for being here. Ashraf, I'm really sorry that we didn't have you physically here because you're actually from Egypt. And it's very unfortunate that we didn't have you here in the room with us. Jamila, I know we are in contact regularly, but I'm very happy to see you here uh, also in our event and for all the support you're giving and all the great work that we're doing with the Moroccan government. And of course, uh, my colleagues from GBPN and Monash University, um, very keen and happy to continue working with you on, on this tool and other, and actually pushing this whole agenda. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank can you I, for those- can I, just, uh, can I just add a, a small comment before? Um, Please, uh, yes, uh, that um, Please. HBRC is, is affiliated by the Arab League, uh, to issue the unified building codes in, in, in the whole Arab League uh, nations. And we got the clearance um, one month ago to, to, to revisit the, the already issued codes. And uh, I believe with our colleague from Morocco, from um, all, Africa, all, all the Arab countries, we can, we can re-update our, our, our goals and um, then we can disseminate the information not only locally, but regionally. And, uh, that's it. Th thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Great news and, and certainly an important opportunity. Um, and the building codes, everybody agrees that that's one of the key tools to actually make the sector advance. Uh, so, and, and there's certainly a need to 